Good morning and welcome to LLT 121, Classical Mythology, in which we discuss today the career of a goddess on a mountaintop, shining like a silver flame, the goddess of beauty and love, Aphrodite is her name, and stuff like that. We were talking last time, as we ended the last discussion, about various paradigms of the supreme love goddess. We just, and the horrible things that happened to her boy toys. We discussed the myth of Aphrodite and Anchises. The gods were tired of Aphrodite boasting about her power over all of the gods and goddesses except for three, so they made her fall in love with Anchises. <laughs> At least fall in lust with Anchises. We talked about the story of Aphrodite and Adonis, whose mother was a tree. We talked about the love story of Cybele, or actually this one was a non-love story. In all of these pairings, the female is the dominant character. In all of these um, pairings, bad things happen to the male and stuff like that. As I jokingly said, I think a couple class periods ago, it's no coincidence that the main deity of love is irrational, that she is picked out to be a female because she is irrational, blah, 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 blah. Obviously, this is a patriarchal society. Assigning to a female character, assigning to a female deity, the irrationality of the love process. On the other hand, we also find ancient Greek males trying to control it. How do the ancient Greek males try to control this notion of love? <coughs> oh, by suggesting women who act on their sexual desires are somewhat less than proper. They try to act on this by enabling themselves to get involved as many love affairs as they want to. We see here the old double standard. The only goddess really who gets away with sleeping around is Aphrodite. She gets away with it because she is the goddess of love. She gets away with it as the goddess of love because she wouldn't be much of a goddess of love and lust if she didn't get it on with just about every guy she took a liking to. I suggested also in our um, last class discussion that um, these myths of the powerful love goddess and her wimpy boy toy who comes to a bad end are tied in one with mystery religions. The boy toy dies, the boy toy comes back again, the boy toy dies, the boy toy comes back again whether his name is Adonis or Attis or Demuzi. It's the boy toy who dies and comes back again. It also ties in, I believe, though, with the good old-fashioned Earth Mother religion. That is to say, the Earth Mother religion is practiced by the indigenous ancient Greeks before the Achaeans came into town. The Earth Mother goddess who is all-powerful over everything, male or female. <coughs> We can certainly see that in the career of Cybele, the goddess who cuts off her membrum wirile, or penis, to um, become female by exercising her free will and so forth. However, a patriarchal civilization such as that of the ancient Greeks can't let a good earth mother stay in power for long. We move to the conceptions of love found in the symposium of Plato. 
A symposium today means a meeting of various experts on a given topic. If we're going to have a symposium on mythology, we have mythological experts come from around the country and hopefully from around the world to discuss mythology. That's what's meant by a symposium. We are going to have Phil Giblin talking about mythology. Carrie Bauer will be speaking about mythology. The deluxe yours truly will be speaking about mythology. But to the ancient Greeks, a symposium was a drinking party. Not the sort of college drinking party one might have seen in that cinematic triumph, National Lampoon's Animal House. It's not a bunch of Greeks in togas, because Greeks didn't wear togas, going around going, woo, woo, woo. <coughs> to Plato and his circle of fellow philosophers, Socrates and his circle of philosophers, a symposium was a party in which there was a good dinner, there was a certain amount of wine drinking to lower the inhibitions, make you more truthful. And then they would talk about a given topic. One time it might be politics, one time the symposium might focus on um, government issues or public affairs, or it might focus on art and the function of art in society. It so happens that at this famous symposium they talked about love. And I want to apologize firsthand for some of the very violently sexist notions contained in Plato's Symposium. I don't agree with them, obviously, and I don't think you're going to agree with them either. For all of um, Plato's status as a founding father of Western civilization, which he is for better or worse, he believed some pretty evil things. We could say the same of, say, Thomas Jefferson, that staunch advocate of the rights of humans who happen to be male and white. I'm not saying this to disrespect President Thomas Jefferson because obviously he did make a great contribution to our nation. I'm just saying, yeah, there are some pretty rotten ideas out there, but please let's not throw out the baby with the bathwater. We can still appreciate Plato and the very good and positive things he has to say about love while still saying, oh my God, he can't believe that. Here's what happens. All the men at Plato's Symposium are drinking and watching the flute girls and serving women dance around, and then when it comes time for the symposium, they kick the women out and say, okay, let's us men talk about love. And let us talk about it in a manly fashion. Um, and there are a lot of alternatives about love that come up during this wide-ranging discussion. We're going to find out that there was a cer certain amount of people who believed that the true, most true form of love took place between two men. And before you go scream, oh my god, they're homosexuals. <laughs> I'll say some of them were. Okay, <coughs> most of them were not. I don't know the exact percentage. I don't know the exact percentage today. Nobody knows the exact percentage today. Yes, some of the ancient Greeks were homosexuals. I say big hairy deal. Plato probably was. He probably was. We have love poems he wrote to <coughs> other men. So what? But the first speech I want to tell you about is the speech of Aristophanes, the comedic genius, the funniest guy for all, for my money, such as it is, in all of classical antiquity. Aristophanes in addition to being this great writer of comedies, was also somewhat follically disadvantaged. But he could laugh at it, and so can I. Aristophanes, by the way, um, well, let's put it this way. Aristophanes really existed. The Aristophanes who speaks in Plato's Symposium speaks and behaves and thinks 
just like the Aristophanes we find in the comedies of Aristophanes. That is to say, using Aristophanes in ancient Greek that we know something about, whose writings we have as a yardstick. Plato does a pretty good job of reproducing speech patterns and thought patterns because what comes up next is so absurd it would almost take a comic genius of the nature of Aristophanes to think it up. According to Aristophanes, in the beginning, all humans had one two-faced head generic human. They had four arms, this is a very bad drawing, four legs, and they reproduced by casting their seed into the ground. This, by the way, is not something Aristophanes really believed happened. Just thought I'd clue you in there. Um, it's another one of these parable thingies. There are three sexes of these people. One sex is male, male. One sex of these is female, female, female on both sides, that is. And one is male slash female, according to Aristophanes. They commit hubris. And as you will recall, hubris is the sin of thinking you're greater than or equal to a deity. The punishment for hubris is what? death, or as in this case, something that makes you wish you were dead. <clears throat> something that makes you wish you were dead. Zeus decides to give them something they wish makes them wish they were dead, and he splits them in half to teach them a lesson. Apollo, okay, well let's erase one half. Turns the face, or sews up the belly over here and turns the face around so it can look down and think about its bad career move. Okay, this drawing is just a very rough drawing. From that point on, from that point on, these newly bisected humans spend the rest of their lives looking for the other half of what was once them. If you are part of a male-female being, you are either a man looking for the woman or a woman looking for the man. If you are part of a woman-woman matchup, you are a lesbian woman who is looking for the other half of you. Or if you're a part of a male-male thing, you are a gay man looking for the other part of you. And for my money, I think that this is really a very moving explanation of love. You can't put what it really means into so many words, but I'll try. You are looking for somebody who is the other half of you. Supposedly, when these, the two halves of a former person reunite, they fling their arms around each other so that they can try to be as close as possible to each other and they die of neglect because they can think of nothing else. In order to help the humans out, Zeus shows a little pity and moves their genitalia to the front, the front being here, so that they can reproduce and so that that way is so that they can ease the pain of separation by having sex with each other. And this again is a nice etiology of love as sex is not only something that is done in order to reproduce but sex is a way in this explanation is a way of closeness by which you can express your love for somebody who is the other half of you. I pause for questions up to this point in the slug of coffee. Um, Scott, any questions? Or Mike? Okay, any questions? I thought that was rather brilliantly related myself, too. Yes, it was, Ray. Um, 
Then Aristophanes jumps off the tracks a little bit. Aristophanes does go on to imply that gay men are the very highest class of people because they're not obsessed with love and procreation, but they are able to turn their minds to more spiritual pursuits, such as politics. I <laughs> will not touch that one. One thing you can say for Aristotle, and I encourage you to go back and read it again, because I think Aristophanes comes around. I think that Aristophanes really is inclusive in his final remarks on the topic, which I have read both in English and in the original ancient Greek, in which really do say, I am referring to all men and women. I am referring to all men and women when I say that the happiness of our race lies in the fulfillment of love. Each must find his or her beloved and be restored to their original nature. Therefore, Socrates, I'm sorry, Aristophanes says we must all worship Eros, the most powerful of deities. That's kind of nice. Everybody needs love. Everybody is half of a person. There is somebody for everybody, but boy, it's pretty tough to find that person. It took me till I was 30. Um, in Socrates' speech, Socrates is like the cleanup hitter, as it were, of the Socratic dialogues as written down by Plato. It's kind of like, you know, you've got your 300 hitters and your base stealers hitting first and second, the people who can do the hit and run well, you know, good bat control, never strike out. But it's always somebody like Barry Bonds or Jose Canseco or something, some muscular, burly dude who can hit the ball about 500 feet. Same thing in Plato's dialogues. You know, the leadoff hitters like Aristophanes get to make their speeches, and then Socrates comes in to drive all the runs home with a 492-foot homer over the center field fence, supposedly. I like Aristophanes' explanation a lot better. It has a lot more to say to me. But here, for what it's worth, is Socrates' speech. Socrates says, I once were learned from a wise woman. Whoa. He says, I once learned from a wise woman. He's going to attribute this whole thing to a woman. Whoa. What a revolutionary concept. Named Diotima. Diotima in ancient Greek means Zeus honorer. <laughs> you can see that one coming. If she's that wise, at least she honors Zeus like a good woman should. And therefore, and is very simply expressed. Supposedly, love, eros, has as his father resourcefulness. And as his mother, poverty. Resourcefulness and poverty mingle in love together and have as their child love, the God of love. Oh, great, another allegory. How is love resourceful? God, I feel like Leo Biscaglia. Love is resourceful. But it is. Because um, love will find a way. Because love makes people do dumb things. If you have to go walking after midnight searching for the one you love, believe me, you will. Or if you have to learn how to play tennis in order to impress the one you love. Or watch French art movies or stuff like that. Or watch football games. You'll do it. Trust me. But by the same token, love is impoverished. Love is always hungry. Because it, 
is kind of depressing to think, okay, you marry your true love at age 25, the person you want to spend the rest of your life with, whatever happened to the thrill of the capture and kill? Okay, that's a good question. So, I mean, you know, you're committed to monogamy, but you're, you know, you look, you know, you, 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 you watch occasional Winona Ryder movies or something like that, or my wife has a Jones for Carrie Elwes, the guy who was in The Princess Bride. You know, no explaining it, but then I look in the mirror and understand a little bit better why she has a Jones for him. Okay? But, more than anything else, love, is an inarticulate longing. I like that. For whatever it is, um, you don't possess. That's how Socrates defines it in his speech. It's like the old saying, you can't always get what you want. You can't always get you want what you want, but if you try sometimes, you just might find you get what you need. Okay. When this longing is applied to physical beauty, it leads to physical love, which is the lowest rung on the ladder of love. <laughs> The ladder of love. And, you know, it's hard not to laugh at it, but it's a rather nice schematic concept. Physical love, the urge to engage in physical love, um, is good, obviously. It results in kids and stuff like that. Children of the flesh. Next. Um, the next target is the longing for spiritual love, which produces children of the spirit. This is, here's some, you want to hear something frightening? You people are in this classroom today. It's Friday and it's nice outside. Because you obviously long and yearn to learn something about classical mythology. No fooling. This makes you children of the spirit. And the scary part is it makes me your daddy. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I knew that would get you. Um, actually, the way that Socrates sees this, and again, this is pretty much you know, misogynist, pretty much, um, you know, man-boy sort of thing. The idea is that an older man takes a young man as his lover, and they become physical lovers first. And this is very well attested in, you know, Greek life. Um, and then, after a while, they're not, it's not a sexual relationship. They've used the sex to bond with each other. And then, you know, the older man becomes the younger man's intellectual mentor. Now, obviously, I myself don't really like that idea very much. Sounds kind of suspicious to me. But if you think of meeting a person that you really do want to spend the rest of your life with, yes, there is a sexual aspect of the thing. You look at this person and go, woohoo. And hopefully they look at you and go, woo-hoo, and all of that. But eventually, if things work out right, you're going to be about 75, 80, 90 years old. When you're lucky, if you can get out, out of bed at once in the morning, much less keep tumbling into bed over and over again, if you see what I mean. And there's no denying that the love between two people have been married between 40 or 50 years there's nothing that being, newly, being newlyweds can't compare to it. There is something that says, you know, the sex thingy is fun at the beginning and it produces kids and it's a great way to build a bonded relationship together, but that the real cement in a relationship between two people is really the everything in between stuff repeated over and over again for a pattern of years. There's something to it, in other words. Let's not throw the 
baby away with the bathwater, it is kind of annoying when Socrates suggests that only two men, one younger and one elder, can enjoy true love. That's crap. But when you think about it, that the sex thingy is a way of attracting, the sex thingy is a way of having kids, the sex thingy is always fun if you do it right, but the real deal in a love affair, the real deal in a strong, committed relationship is ultimately that part which goes up here. Oh my God, I feel like Dr. Ruth or something like that. I'll have to tell you a really good story next. And yes, I know we're way behind, but uh, that's fine. We'll, we'll work it out somehow. One of my favorite pieces of literature of all time is a novel called The Golden Ass. <laughs> he said ass. He said ass on camera. Ass, ass, ass. That's what it's called. Um, it was written by a guy named Apuleius who was born in Africa. Okay, He was an African by birth. Grew up speaking Punic, which is the official language of Carthage, but also, also learned Greek very well and learned Latin very well. He was at home in all three cultures. He was a traveling orator slash philosopher. You'd have to understand that there were touring philosophers in that di those days. Yes. Third century. Um, yes, it was third century A.D. That is to say, the two hundreds. Okay? No, actually, it's first century. Late first century, early second. He's a member of the second sophistic movement. And he writes this novel about a dude named Lucius. Lucius is a cool dude. He's this young guy. He's 19 or thereabouts. He's a college student aged kind of guy. And like the stereotypical college student age, notice I said stereotypical gentleman. College age student guy person, you know, he basically, yeah, he wants to learn things. But what he really wants to do is party and meet babes. And he does. He meets this hot looking babe who works as a slave for a witch. They have fun. There are sex scenes in this book. Um, and once they've bonded through sex, they don't take it up a notch to the next platonic thing, educate me, my love, and I will educate you right back. No, no, no. Here's what he says. Hey, babe, I noticed that your boss is a witch. Can you get some magic goo from her so that I can rub it on myself and turn myself into a bird? He's curious. He wants to find crap out that, you know, he doesn't have a right to know. And she's so in love with him. She says, okay, honey. And she gets him some magic goo, like Eye of Newt, okay, <laughs> that's a concept. And finally gets some stuff to rub on him, and he rubs it all over himself, and he's waiting to turn into a bird. He says, oh, this is going to be cool, I'm going to fly around and go chirp, chirp. And instead, he turns into an ass. He turns into a donkey. You know, four legs, floppy ears. He's trying to say, I got turned into a donkey, and this really sucks. But how does it come out? You know, he is really a donkey. And he, it's my life as a donkey. He experiences, you know, he tries to tell his horse that he rode in on, literally. Hey, look, it's me, Lucius. Give me some food. <laughs> and the horse kicks him. You know, he's chased through the streets with a by people with a stick, you know. Damn donkey, trying to eat my front yard. The only way he can drive him around is with this explosive fecal matter emanating from his hindquarters. But he starts to learn. He learns how evil life really can be when you're not a spoiled little rich kid. Oh, people beat him and steal him and carry him off. People say things to each other in front of him. He hears things. He hears stories that he never would have heard if he was just this snot-nosed college kid. I mean, yeah, of course I can tell you the story of how I did blah, 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 because there's only me, you, and this donkey over here. While Lucius the donkey is in the cave, and he's a donkey, right? People are riding around on him. 
He's in a cave because he's been kidnapped with a beautiful maiden, and he hears the story of Cupid and Psyche, which is a beautiful allegory. And you can't leave until I'm done. Young Psyche is so beautiful that Venus, remember this story is written in Latin, so it's Venus, can't take it anymore. And she sends her son Cupid, who's not this cute little better bow guy, you know, but he's a very handsome, you know, he's like Brad Pitt with wings. Is that okay? Mel Gibson slash Brad Pitt with wings, who flies around and stuff. He says, she, Venus says to Cupid, make this poor woman fall in love with the worst thing that ever happened to mankind. More about which later. Meanwhile, back in Psyche's hometown, word has it that a horrible serpent is coming. The serpent is going to destroy the town unless a virgin is sacrificed. A beautiful one. So they decide to sacrifice Psyche. Psyche's not very happy about this, but a girl has literally got to do, she's just a girl in the world, and she has to do whatever she's supposed to do. So, here's our brave heroine Psyche standing on the edge of a cliff, you know, waiting for her monster to take her away, none too eagerly. She thinks, oh, to heck with it, and steps out, because this is not one of those like Bugs Bunny or Wild E. Coyote cartoons where you can walk on forever as long as you don't look down and notice that you're not walking on anything. She plummets, and her last thought is, bye. <laughs> but she wakes up in this beautiful palace. There's nobody else around, but this beautiful palace where all food and drink are brought to her and stuff like that. And um, this mysterious stranger in the dark of every night comes and makes passionate love with her and says, you must never, never, ever look at me. Okay. We all know, by the way, it's Cupid. She doesn't. Finally, she says, but honey, honey, <laughs> but honey, I'm all, I'm all alone here. Can I at least talk to my sisters? Can my sisters come for a visit? Okay, honey, just as long as you don't try to look at me after we've made love. Can you guess what kind of personality the two older sisters have? That you're curious and wicked. Older siblings are always wicked. Just ask my little brother and my little sister. And the two sisters come down, and they fill her head with horrible ideas. Oh, yeah, he's a real horrible monster. He's a horrible monster with five heads, all of whom look like Weird Al Yankovic or something <laughs> like that. Um, and he's going to, you know, give you, he's gotten you pregnant with a little monster. It's going to pop out of your belly like that little thing in Aliens or something. It's going to look like this. Mama! Um... And she's her little sister, so she listens to all of this. And, you know, um, the two sisters fly back home, and she is lying there in bed. There is perhaps a little less spring in her lovemaking that night because she can't help but think, you know, like, my God, this is like a six-headed monster that I'm doing it with, you know? And so after they've made love, and after he's smoked his cigarette and fallen asleep, she takes an oil lamp and lights the oil lamp to get a look at what she has been performing the love deed with. And she looks and she goes, oh my God, it's like a combination of Mel Gibson and Brad Pitt with wings, woo hoo. And she lets a drip of burning oil spill on him by accident. He flies up. <laughs> You know, he's got wings, right? He says, you idiot, you dip. Um, I told you not to do this. Now I'm in trouble with my mom, Venus, who told me to have you killed or something. Um, um, and you're pregnant, but tough luck, because you're also out of here. Hit the road. 
and poor Psyche is forced to hit the road. She is with child. She has no place to go. Cupid is mad at her. Venus is still mad at her. And when the goddess of love is mad at you, you got problems. Because poor Psyche, she prays, oh, goddess um, Demeter, or Ceres is her Roman name. Please help me. And Ceres slash Demeter, goddess of grain, says, Sorry, Psyche, I'm not going to help you. She's going to make me turn myself into a horse and do it with Poseidon again or something. Okay, you don't mess with the goddess of love. She asks Hera to help her, or her Roman name, Juno. Oh, great mother goddess Juno, queen of heaven, etc., etc. Um, help me. Um, I'd love to, Psyche. I'd love to. Um, um, I'm late for a meeting. I'm late for the, the bridge club or something. And she gets out of there because... You don't hurry, love, and you don't hack it off at you either. Oh, Psyche does get in her chops. She does get to do some things. Um, it's kind of sweet. I don't know how she kills the one sister, but one of her two sisters, she offs in the following manner. Yes, my husband, Cupid, who looks like a, hus you know, like a combination of Brad Pitt and Mel Gibson, really loves you. Oh, really? Yes, you're far more beautiful and intelligent than me. He wants you to go out to the cliff and at the stroke of 12, take a step down and he'll kind of like waft you down to his house and make passionate love to you. Oh, really? So, you know, she walks out, you know, says, woohoo. <laughs> That's the end of her. Golf clap. Okay. Meanwhile, Psyche's got a problem. To make, to make um, matters brief, Venus, you know, the action is building up. Venus puts out a missing persons, an all-points bulletin out on Psyche. She wants to get Psyche and kick her butt. So Psyche's running away. Psyche tries to commit suicide. And finally, they bring Psyche into Venus. And Venus says, I'm going to give you a chance. Now, this woman is eight months pregnant, right? I'm going to give you a chance. You have to perform four tasks. Task number one, he, she points to this big, huge pile of grain. Eight different grains, all mixed up. She says, I want them sorted out into eight different piles of one grain each by morning. All of a sudden, some ants come marching in. A whole tag team of ants comes in and the ants sort the grain out for her. So the next morning when Venus reports in, they think, ah, this ought to be, you little snot, okay. Your next task is to um, um, green. Your next task <laughs> is to take the wool from these man-eating sheep. And Psyche's thinking, oh great, how am I going to get the wool off these um, man-eating sheep? But she figures it out. I think a talking dog <laughs> or something tells her to at noon. The sheep are going to fall asleep in the shade of trees. They're going to scratch themselves up against the trees. All you have to do is, when they fall asleep, pull the wool off the trees. And she does. She does what she's told. And that's task number two. Venus is getting really mad. And number three, she says, okay, number two is wool. Number three is water. Go down to hell the river of Cocytus, the river of whaling. What's the technical term for a round trip to hell? Thank you. This is a catabasis. And go get me some of the water from there. Of course, the water, the river Cocytus, falls down these tremendous falls and it's surrounded by all sorts of rocks and, you know, she's gonna fall in and die if she so much as tries it. Whereas Jupiter, otherwise known as Zeus, his eagle comes buzzing in, a pretty lady, and, um, you know, gets her a little bit of the water, says, take this up to Venus. Turn. 
Venus is getting really mad. She says, this ought to do it. Go down to the underworld and speak to Persephone. This is number four. And say, Venus requires a little bottle of your beauty. Persephone grants Psyche this wish. Persephone knows what it's like to be messed over by the gods and goddesses. So she says, here, Psyche, here is a little vial of my beauty for you to take up to Venus, the goddess of beauty and love, and whatever you do, don't open it. Have you run into this one before? Don't open it, Scott. Where? Okay, yeah, that's true. How about Pandora's box? This is a clear reference to Pandora's box. But you're right, Scott, because what happened when your mom or dad told you, and whatever you do, don't open that box? Just like Pandora did, just like um, Psyche does, because she does. She, right before she reports to Venus, she says, I wonder what's in here. And she looks in there and <laughs> Next thing she knows, she's flat blotto on the ground and pregnant. Um, at this point, time is wasting. We've got to get to the credits here. Um, um, Cupid comes flying in, looking even more studly than ever, and realizes, I still love her. She's pregnant with my baby. She's having my baby. Um, and finally, they all figure out the poor woman, you know, here she is lying unconscious. She's just been to hell. She's going to give birth any second now. They take a vote and decide the poor woman has indeed suffered enough, so they kind of wake her up. They give her a slug of ambrosia, the drink of the gods and goddesses, so she can be immortal. And then they whisk her off into the birthing room where <laughs> she gives birth to a child named Woluptas or Joy. That's sweet. What's the happy ending? Very briefly, Cupid or Cupido is the Latin word for the urge to rut. Okay? Um, psyche is the Greek word for soul. Cupid stands for the urge to rut. Psyche stands for the urge to bond spiritually. Cupid is a Latin god. Psyche is a Greek god girl's name. And when Cupid and Psyche come together finally and unite, the result is joy. But <laughs> as we can tell from the story, it's not that easy to do, is it? You got to go to hell a couple of times at least before you can experience true, true love. But Lucius the donkey listens to the story, reflects on it, and eats a mouthful of hay. In our next class, we will talk about very briefly the goddess Athena and the god Hermes. <laughs>